all that stuff and, and that's good. So we've been talking about Kingdom Reset. Not talking about it, this is essential. I mean, it's not even up for debate. It's basically, I see it this way. We either reset or we die. Because we can't keep going the way we were going. We can't keep doing what we were doing. Unless things are changing and growing, they're dying. And God's really pressed this upon my heart. Not just my heart, many other people. But the situation that happened in the natural, everybody had to stop, reevaluate, take stock. And now as a church body, we've done the same. But now we need to reset, go back to original factory settings. With the purpose being of this in Matthew 6.10. Manifest your kingdom realm. And cause your very purpose to be fulfilled on the earth. That's what it's about. Your kingdom come and your will be done. Not mine. Not everyone else's. Yours, Lord. And that's going to happen through me. So that's our principle as we saw in Acts 5.15. As Peter was simply walking by, the power of God was emanating from him, touching other people. And as I've already shared this morning, our reset questions are this. What am I doing and why am I doing that? You need to be asking yourself that every day. And not just once a day, multiple times a day. What am I doing and why am I doing it? Because 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says this. Put yourselves to the test and judge yourselves to find out whether you're living in faith. Are you living in faith? Are you walking by faith? Are you walking by your own intellect? Are you walking by the natural pressures that are around you? What am I doing and why am I doing it? And the perception is we found in Acts 2, 12 and 13, is people are going to think you're nuts. When kingdom people walk with natural minded people, they think you're nuts. That's what we saw in the text. On the day of Pentecost, these people are drunk. They were astonished, they were confused. What are some of the other words they used? Dumbfounded. They said, what is this phenomenon going on? Just like some people said, you know, what's with the door that's not been opened since Pentecost Sunday again? What was that thing just opening on its own during that sermon? You know, what is this phenomenon? It's called the wind of the Spirit. God moving in a tangible way. That's what ought to be happening all the time. So now... We're starting, we started last week a new reset principle. I want you to throw up that next slide if you would. And this principle deals with honor. Dealing with the principle of honor again. Understanding what honor is, what it's not. And unfortunately, like I shared last week, the two main, the two first views of that word actually came in a negative sense. So just to touch a couple points that we learned last week on this principle of honor, why are we doing a reset on this first off? I, I got here. It says, because the spirit of familiarity has infected the body of Christ and the body is suffering from that infection. And unless this infection is eradicated, the ecclesia will never become the assembly Jesus spoke of when he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Unless the spirit gets eradicated, we're never going to see his church built, his ecclesia built the way he wants it built. Do you understand the worst infection that we can have is from the inside? We know that in our own body. Infections are no big deal when they're on the outside, right? No big deal. That's why they tell us with this virus, right? This is probably the place you're going to get it the most. You're going to pick it up somewhere. What are you supposed to do? Wash your hands. Clean your hands. Don't do this. Because you've got one, two, three, four inputs right here. Because it's okay here. I'm not going to bother anything here. And then guess what you're going to do? You're going to kill it because you're going to wash. Don't get it here and then do this. Because once it's on the inside, it's hard to eradicate. That's what happens with demonic spirits. Once they get inside the house, they get hard to eradicate. And I found it interesting. The first time Jesus preached, we saw in Mark's when he was in the temple, he cast out a demon. They said, what are you doing here? Leave us alone. 
He's casting demons out of God's house. So we don't want the infection in the house. Because then when the house is infected, it's not functioning properly. So that's why we're looking at, at this spirit of familiarity, I'm calling it. And, and I'm not just honing it down to one. I mean, we, as we look at text, we could say, oh yeah, I see that there, that there, that there too. But this is just the issue that God really spoke to me about was this spirit of familiarity. So last week, I just want to recap two things that we saw. We discovered, as I put here, a couple eye-opening things about this issue of dishonor. One is God ain't cool with complaining or talking about his kids. He not cool with that. Okay, and we saw that in Numbers 12 too, when I'm, I'm believing that Miriam's the one that said this. Who does he think he is? The Lord has spoken to us, not just him. Remember, Moses takes another wife. Aaron and Miriam were upset about that. And I believe she said, who does he think he is? Doesn't God speak to us too? Now let me give you a couple of New Testament scriptures that say the, say the same thing. In, in Romans 14 and verse 4, this is a Passion Translation, says this. Do you... Who do you think you are to sit in the judgment of someone else's household servant? And then it brings clarity to that phrase. It says, we are all household servants in the body of Christ, for we each belong to him. When believers begin to judge others over our opinions or preferences, we are taking the role that only belongs to Jesus. That's huge. When we start judging each other over our opinions and preferences, this is what I talked about a little bit on the message at, at 1 o'clock. I just need to touch on it here. Do you understand you do not have absolute truth residing in you? You have revelational truth. The Word of God is true. Your understanding of the Word of God is not truth. It's your revelation of the truth. That is a huge difference. Because part of this spirit of familiarity says, I don't believe like you do, I'm out of here. Well, I hope you don't believe like I do. You know why? Because if there's two of me, one is unnecessary. <laughs> know what I mean? Everybody wants to make everybody the same. Let's all conform. Let's all look, act, and talk the same, and walk the same, and quack the same. Well, if we're all doing that, there's many that are unnecessary. You only need one to do that job. The rest are wasting their time. So we've got to understand we're all unique in this. And I'm going to get to that a little bit later. We've got to stop with this conformity stuff. That we are going to believe the same, act the same, look the same, talk the same, walk the same. And all that junk that I was taught, of course, none of you were, I get that, but I was. Because if that's really the case, then only one person is necessary and all others just ought to leave. There is great power in the diversity and the uniqueness and the different perspectives that people bring to the table. And we've got to knock this junk off. We really do. Because that's another spirit that's infecting from the inside that's destroying the house of God. Let me give you the next verse. You can read the rest of the other verses right there. Romans 14.10 says this. But who, but why do you judge your brother? Have you ever heard that? You can't judge me. God says right there, don't judge me. You can't judge me. Well, as a matter of fact, I can. And you can judge me. And you better judge me. If you see me out running around drinking and sleeping with other women, you better judge me and kick me out of this place. You bet to judge me. Okay? In fact, you can go to, what was it, 1 Corinthians 5? I forget the text. Where it says, hey, you got a guy in the church sleeping with his stepmother, you best kick him out. So yeah, judgment happens. But this is the key right here. The rest of the verse says this, why do you show contempt for your brother? 
We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now I'm going to leave that little piece there because I don't want, not that piece, but what I just said about the judging piece. We'll get to that down the road sometime. Because the phrase I want us to get is this. Why do you show contempt to your brother? Now look at there in your notes. We want to define what the word contempt means. It means the feeling or attitude of regarding someone or something as inferior. That's contempt. Base or worthless, scorn, disdain. The state of being despised or dishonored, disgraced. We understand it in legal term, right? In the courtroom, we say they're in what? Contempt of court. What does that mean? It says right here, they were willfully disobediently, willfully disobediently, disobedient or openly disrespectful of. You know, you can't tell the judge to go pound sand. If the judge tells you to sit down and shut up, you best sit down and shut up. If not, you're in contempt of court. Because what are you doing? You're holding the one in authority who's sitting in the seat as worthless. So again, we've got to get back to this place of honor and understanding what God's saying. He's not real keen on contempt. Because the other piece that I kind of missed there was when Miriam kind of got called out. Remember they got called out on the carpet, all three. He told Aaron, Miriam, step forward. He kind of chewed him out. He was upset. Well, I'm going to get to that in a minute. Didn't go well for her, did it? But this issue with contempt, this is, this is the part I want us to understand because this is going on daily. We need to realize you can actually disagree with someone without having contempt in your heart towards them. You can disagree. And that's what I believe we saw with Miriam and Aaron. See, disagreements usually happen when two people view a particular subject from a different perspective. Remember way back, God reminded me of this this morning, I, I had an illustration up on the board where it was the number six or it was the number nine, depending on who was standing where, remember? It's like, no, that's number nine, that's number nine. From his perspective, it was a nine. From the other perspective, the other person the other way, it was a six. And they're arguing back and forth. Why? Their perspective was different. And that's okay, we all have different perspectives. You know why? We're not all the same. We all see things differently because of who we are, our upbringing, our life experiences, culture, our age. There's a vast variety of reasons why we all see things differently. And it's okay to have a different perspective than somebody else. But we need to understand that contempt is completely different. Contempt is a serious heart issue. See, what contempt turns into is this, and, and it's probably best that I just illustrate it. Contempt turns into, it, it looks like this. You're having a discussion with somebody, and all of a sudden the discussion blows up ugly, and they start attacking you and calling your names and just tearing your character up. Now, I remember back when I worked at UPS years ago when the presidential election between Obama and McCain was happening. And I'm talking with another co-worker. Now, you've got to understand, we're in a union shop. So we're talking back and forth about different things about the two candidates. And I says, well, I'm voting for McCain because I don't buy Obama's policies, and I think they'll hurt the country, and blah, 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 blah. So I mean, this is after a discussion we had for a while. Now, we've conversed many times. This guy knew I was a Christian, knew I was an associate pastor at the time. We've engaged in good conversations. So as soon as I said that, well, I'm not voting for Obama because I don't believe that his policies will be good for the country, he looked right at me and said, what are you, a racist? You don't want to see the first black president elected? And I said, I don't care about what color the guy is. I don't think that what he's saying and his policies are good for the country. See, that's holding contempt for somebody. That's when it becomes a hard issue. It's no longer just in a disagreement. It becomes now I have to attack your character. I have to belittle you. I have to tear you down. I have to treat you as worthless because I disagree with your perspective on a certain topic. That's bad news, guys. God does not look favorably 
on that type of situation at all. And again, that's what we discovered. That was the second piece we discovered last week, was God isn't contu- real cool with a contempt- contemptuous heart. Numbers 12, 9 and 10 says this, God was very angry with them. Like I said, Miriam and Aaron, he called them forward at the temple. And the cloud moved away from the temple, and there stood Miriam, her skin as white as snow from leprosy. She got judged right then and there. Now, don't do this like I had somebody do this to me on social media last week. Oh, the Old Testament ain't valid no more. We live under a new covenant. They even gave me under Hebrews. Said the old has gone away. I said, good luck with that. Because I find over here in Acts chapter 5, two folk named Ananias and Sapphira. Things didn't go well for them either under the new covenant. Now, you can look at that story and say, well, this was the reason, that was the reason. You know, I look at it, it's different, but it's very similar. And it's similar this way. And it's in your text, I'm not going to read it just for sake of time. But you remember the story, right? They go sell their property, bring the money, didn't bring all the money was asked if they brought all the money. And Ananias said, yes. Peter said, what'd you lie for the God for? Right? And he ended up dead on the spot. Here's the two similarity pieces that we got to understand. The first one is Ananias had a heart issue. He said, why have you let Satan fill your heart? That's why the Bible tells us to guard our heart above all else. The devil is after your heart. If he has your heart, he's got you. And what I mean by heart is your thinker and your feeler and your chooser. Because that's where he focuses at, your soul. He wants to turn a very factual-based, logical argument into a feeling, emotional thing and whip it all up where now people are contemptuous in their heart towards one another and calling them names and stomping their feet and throwing things at each other and then leaving and then disfriending themselves on Facebook. That's when you know it's a heart issue. And we have to check this constantly. Really, God? Now I got a rat on myself. What are you laughing about? (laughs) Someone was on social media and I made a comment to to this lady who who made this statement. And and it basically was challenging her motive. I said, nah, you ain't looking for the truth or whatever. I get in a whole thing. But I was basically saying, the question you asked really wasn't the question. You obviously have a point of view and so does in other people. So she wrote to me back and said, you're kind of judging where I'm going, and no, I just really want an answer to the question. And the Spirit of God pierced me. And so why are you judging this woman's motive? I don't even know the woman. So I wrote back and apologized, says, I am sorry, you are correct. I don't know what your intent was and what you wrote. But the reason why he wants me to share that this morning is see how quick we can do that See how quick we can assume the other person's motive and thought process behind a simple words that we see like this. That's why every day we get to say, what am I doing and why am I doing it? Lord, am I really judging this person's character? Am I really, do I really have contempt in my heart to, to a person that I don't even know who it is? And the person actually thanked me for apologizing, wrote back. And I said, okay, then I will briefly answer your question. And I did, and it kind of ended right there. Just wanted to know my opinion. Not mine, but anyone on the thread, you know. But my first inclination was, no, you're just looking for a fight and an argument. Because a lot of people do that today. But that wasn't right for me to do. See what I'm saying? We, we get into that mode so easily and quickly today that this really has to get pulled down and, and this infection needs to get destroyed. So a contemptuous heart is a heart issue. 
That's what happened with Ananias and Sapphira. Satan filled their heart. So where's the contemptuous issue? What were they holding in contempt? What did they devalue? What did they dishonor? And what they dishonored and devalued was the sacrifice of everyone else who did give all. Know what I mean? They made their sacrifice look even less. They said, hey, I can get away with the same praise, honor, and everybody looking at me, patting me on the back by only giving a portion of it. I don't got to give the whole thing. So they actually devalued the people who actually went and sacrificed. God didn't like that. It didn't work out well for them. So now let's look at Matthew 13. We kind of alluded to this a few times. We're going to look at Jesus. Matthew 13 is an awesome chapter. We're going to look at the very end. Jesus speaks a bunch of parables about the kingdom. The kingdom is like, the kingdom is like, the kingdom is like. We get down to verse 53 and it says, Right after Jesus taught this series of parables, he left from there. When Jesus arrived in his hometown of Nazareth, so Jesus headed for home, it says, He began teaching the people in the synagogue. Okay, we're going to see the same kind of phraseology here. Everyone was dazed, overwhelmed with astonishment over the depth of revelation they were hearing. So Jesus went home. And he goes into the synagogue and starts teaching. Blowing people away. That was just like on Pentecost. They were dumbfounded. They were astonished. Wait, where, what's all this going on? And then look at what it says next. They said to one another, so it's people sitting there, just visualize it. Here's Jesus. He's teaching, giving revelation. Everyone's sitting there. They said to one another, where did this man get such wisdom and marvelous powers? So stuff was going on. Where to get this wisdom? Where to get this power? Now look at verse 55. It says, Isn't he just the woodworker's son? Isn't his mother named Mary? And his four brothers, Jacob, Joseph, Simon, and Judah? And doesn't his sisters live here? How did he get all this revelation and power? And then it goes on. And the people became offended, and they turned against them. And Jesus said, the only one place a prophet isn't honored, it is in his hometown. So let's look at this a second. He goes home, goes in the synagogue, begins to teach. Obviously something was going on. It said miraculous powers. And said, isn't this guy just the woodworker's son? Who's this guy? We know this guy. You know? Because I can see Glee right there. I'll pick on her. Ain't she just the mailman's kid? I mean, the milkman's kid? We know her. Yeah, that's, that's the milkman's kid. You know? We know her. Yeah, she grew up around here. Yeah, we know, we know the family. But notice what happened. They're questioning, how did he get these powers? And then Jesus said the people became offended. It wasn't like, oh yeah, we know so-and-so. You know, came back home. Yeah, we know them. No, 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 it offended them. And not only that, they turned against him. They were no longer offended. Now they turned against. And Jesus said, the one place a prophet isn't honored is his own hometown. Now look at verse 58. And their great unbelief kept him from doing any mighty miracles in Nazareth. Now what's interesting, there's a lie that goes through the church that says, your unbelief can stop the power of God. That's the most stupidest thing. Your unbelief is going to stop the power that created all things. Really? You are that big? Well, yeah, ain't that what it said? No. It's not what it said. That's your understanding of what it said. That may be your revelation of what it said. 
but that's not really what it said. Because I got a couple other verses here from different translations that's going to help us see better what it said and understand this importance and destructiveness of this spirit of familiarity. And if I'm not saying that word right, I apologize. It kind of gets twisted in my tongue. Matthew 13, 58. And the NLV version says this, He did not do many powerful works there because they did not put their trust in him. Okay? They didn't put their trust in him. So what did they do when they looked at him? Ah, that's just Joseph's boy. They already dishonored him, demeaned him. They are showing contempt for him. They are devaluing him because of who his father is and who his mother is. They're not looking at him for who he is. They're looking at him from the family he came from, right? So they didn't have their trust in him. But the message translation really cleared it up for me. Hopefully it'll bring better understanding to you. It says this, Jesus said, a prophet is taken for granted in his hometown and his family. So the prophet, Jesus was also an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, right? He was all the fivefold in one. He just happens to be using the phrase prophet right here. But it says it's taken for granted where in his hometown and in his family. Yep, that's just Jim. We knew Leader and Jim. We knew them when they lived on Pumping Station Road. Yep, I remember seeing him, you know, he got a Dewey, and yep, I know that kid. You know, who the heck does he think he is? Standing up there, I know that boy. I know his history. Right? That's what he's talking about here. He's taken for granted in his hometown and his family. He didn't do many miracles there because of, now catch this, their hostile indifference. He didn't do many miracles because of their hostile indifference towards him because they held him in contempt and said, we know you, we know where you're from. We know your history. We know your family. Yeah, we've heard rumors about that carpenter guy. Yeah, he knocked up mom. And they weren't pregnant. That wasn't cool. Yeah, we've heard these stories. We know what kind of ilk they come from. That's what they're saying. See, Miriam put it this way. Who does he think he is? The town folk said, how does he get all this revelation and power? Isn't he just the woodworker's son? Same thing. See, a, a spirit of familiarity seeks to create an offense with the express purpose of causing you to turn against or have a hostile indifference towards the very person God has placed before you so that you can receive the solution that you've been seeking. See, it's not that he didn't have the power to do it because of their unbelief. It was their hostile indifference towards him that they couldn't receive what he had because they devalued it as worthless. Because we know who that guy is. And they based their value of him on his pedigree. That spirit of familiarity will try to create an offense. Which brings people to the place of a hostile indifference so that they cannot receive. That's why this thing is so dangerous. When we become too familiar with one another, that is dangerous. And what happens is the longer we hang out and the longer we know one another, the more easily we get familiar with each other, but we can't get to this place because the spirit is always at work. Trying to cause an offense, an indifference. Well, you can't receive.
Here's the takeaway. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7. This is in the voice translation. It says, Now there are many kinds of grace gifts, but they are all from the same Spirit. There are many different ways to serve, but they all directed by the same Lord. There are many amazing working gifts in the church, but it is the same God who energizes them all in all who have the gifts. Okay, so what's he saying here in a nutshell? There's a great diversity in the body. Huge diversity of gifts and powers, giftings, but you know what? They all come from God. That's why he said, who are you to sit in judgment of my household servant? Who are you to become so familiar with so-and-so that you say, hey, I'm a fan, who, where do they get these revelations? Where do they get these understandings? What makes them think they're all that in a bag of chips? Verse 7 says this. This is what we got to understand. Each believer has received the gift. Each believer has received the gift. I don't care if you know what it is or not. Each believer has a gift. If you don't know what it is, that's not on God, that's on you. Figure it out. Each believer has a gift that manifests the Spirit's power and presence so that they know it ain't you because it manifests the Spirit's power and presence. That gift is given for the good of the whole community. It ain't for you. It's for everybody else. Verse 7 in the New Living Translation puts it this way. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Do you know why it's so important not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together as a manner of some is? Because you got something that somebody may need and you didn't show up that day to give it to them. Do you know why we got to stop devaluating each other and looking at each other that way? Because then you will have a hostile indifference and you will no longer receive. And you'll start name calling and you'll start pointing fingers and you'll start causing division. Is this making sense? Because we got to really understand this. It is natural for us to get comfortable and familiar with one another. It's natural for us to disagree with one another. When we get to the place when it becomes a heart issue and we can't receive from one another, we've got a big problem. And a lot of churches are at that place because we get so familiar with the people. And we're going to talk about other things. We're going to talk about a husband and wife relationship. We're going to talk about our relationship with the government. We're going to talk about honor. And what does that really mean when it says, you know, honor your mother and father even. Honor husband and wife. Honor the government. Honor, it says many times here to honor. There is no more honor in society. People are so vile and ignorant today, it blows me away. It blows me away how even family members can be so vile and ignorant towards one another. Because this spirit is running rampant. Oh, that's just so and so. I've told you over the years, I've had things said to me as the preacher I would have never said to my pastor in the past or treated or done. And again, this ain't about me. Because God's working on me. He already showed me I had that thing tweaking in me I had to get rid of and apologize this past week. So this ain't a finger pointing thing. This is a thing that we really have to get back to in the kingdom of God, understand what honor is truly about. You do not honor the physical person. You honor the gift and giftings that God gave them and made them to be. Did that make sense? Now one way I was honored before when I started functioning in the gifts, I was called the healing pastor. 
Healing and deliverance was my thing. If someone had a devil, someone needed deliverance, someone needed healing, somebody needed physical healing, the leadership at that last church would say, go see Jim. It's not that Jim was special. They recognized what Jim carried. That's what I'm saying. That's just an example. This is what we got to get back to. Each one has a gift. Each one is valuable to the body. Each part of the body needs to function as it was designed to function and stop looking at the other functioning parts and say, who does he think he is? Who does that eyeball think it is, says the toe. Really? But we bought into this. This has infected the church bad. And I mean, it's infected society. See, lost folk gonna act like lost folk. That ain't the issue. But when it comes in here, and not here physically, but you know what I mean, into the body of Christ. And even people playing into it. I'm not going to go there. All right, let me read this. Once you are infected with the spirit of familiarity, you will not be able to receive the gifting that another carries within them by the Holy Spirit. An offended, hostile, dishonoring person can't receive anything from the person they are offended with. If somebody's offended with me, they ain't receiving nothing. If I'm offended with my wife, she could say whatever she wants to, and I ain't receiving nothing. If you get offended with somebody, you will receive nothing from that person, and then you'll end up getting a hostile indifference and actually pointing fingers at the other person as if they are the issue. See, the spirit of familiarity is M.O. I just got some of these things. These have actually... I've heard and if not been said directly to me. Who does he think he is? Does he think he's better than me? I hear from the Lord too. We are all the same in God's family. Uh, we're not. Giftings and callings are different. Why are we the same? I addressed that last week. Because we are birthed from the Father. We are all loved the same. We are not all treated and gifted the same. We are to walk out our own destiny. You know that if you have multiple kids in your family, you don't treat them all the same because they're not the same. So why would you treat them the same? Why would you think God treats everybody in the family of God the same? He doesn't. Or another one, I'm just as gifted as he is. Where does he get these revelations from? He must be a false prophet. God didn't show me that revelation. I don't believe what he's even saying is biblical. All those are indications is contempt. And we've got to be careful of that. See, as I, I get lined out here, complaining. It all began with complaining. They were talking about a disagreement. It all began with that. Miriam, Aaron, talking about their brother getting married. Why couldn't they just be happy for him? Well, who's he think he is marrying that woman? God speaks to us too. And like I said, he must have said God told me to do that. Because he was already married. He already had a wife. I don't know the ins and outs, but there's got to be a reason why they said, who does he think he is? God speaks to me too. See, it begins with complaining. Then complaining turns into an offense. Then an offense turns into a hostile indifference. Then dishonoring happens. And that creates an upset God. And we've got to be careful about that. See, again, Romans 14.4 says this, Who do you think you are to sit in judgment of someone else's household servant? When you get to that place of contempt in your heart, now you are judging that person, you are dishonoring that person, you are dismeaning, demeaning that person, you are creating that person to be valueless. Their opinion is worthless to me. Their revelational knowledge is worthless to me. 
Because again, watch at one o'clock. We ain't all supposed to think the same. You know why? I'll just give you the punchline. We all got different paths. We're all supposed to be walking united, hand in hand, because that's what it says in Amos. How can you walk together unless you're agreed? We're all walking like this. I'm walking this way, but you're in that path. I'm in this lane, you're in that lane, another one in that lane, another one in that lane. Person way over there in that lane don't need to know what I need to know to be in this lane. Where do we get this stuff? I know where we get it, right here. A devil. A devil wants to create offense and indifference and have us devalued in each other's eyes because when God created man, he made us all equal that way. We are all made in his image. But he didn't gift us and call us the same. So his love's the same. His mercies are the same. I won't go to his grace, because that's empowerment. You don't need to be empowered the way I'm empowered. But the thing we got to get back to is honoring one another as a servant of the living God, as a child of the living God, knowing we all have unique giftings and that gifting is for the benefit of all. We got to stop looking down on folk that we disagree with and being contemptuous towards them, judging them, running around backbiting them, Running around saying, don't go over there, that's a cult over there. Don't go over there, that's a false prophet over there. You are devaluing what God created that person to be. Oh yeah, don't listen to that one, that's just a penda. That's just the kid of a milkman. Don't you know that? Serious. I ain't kidding, this stuff happens all the time. And the first place it's got to get rooted out is right here. Right? We got to make sure we do not function in that. That we look at somebody else that we may disagree with, but we do not make that disagreement into a contemptuous issue and a demeaning, defaming, degrading, devaluing of that person. Does that make sense? Because that's what that spirit will do. So again, it begins with complaining. Quit complaining. In a sense, your complaining is actually valuable in the sense that you know you don't see things like the guy you're complaining against. And that's a good thing because you're not them. And you shouldn't see it the same way. Because we got to get back to the place. I'm a sovereign individual created by an almighty God for a divine destiny that I am responsible to walk out because at the end when it said we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, he's not going to ask me who I agreed with, who I disagreed with, who I belittled, who I did whatever. That's going to be wood, hay, and stubble and all that's getting burned up. That's where judgment is going to come. See, you can judge a person. This is the Holy Spirit said to me yesterday. He's bringing it to mind, so I guess I got to say it. You can judge a person, but you cannot proclaim judgment upon a person. I went, wow. Thank you, Lord. You do not proclaim judgment upon a person unless you see it as biblical judgment like Paul did with that guy. Kick him out of the church. He said, sexual immorality, you don't deal with that in the church. It's like loving it. It just infects. So we see clear measures on how to deal with situations, but you don't, comp you don't declare judgment upon another person or damn another person. Do you understand the power you have in your words? So we've got to be careful with all this. Do not look at someone else with contempt in your heart, and you may not even know you have it, because if you do, you can't receive from them, and that may be the very person God brought by to take care of your need. Because guess what? If you could have figured it out from your perspective, ooh, God, this is good. If you could have figured it out from your perspective, with your intellect, with your wisdom, and your revelational truth, you would have. You can't see the answer. That's why he's going to bring somebody by from a completely different viewpoint and perspective to give it to you. Because you're stuck. 
But no, you want to fight with them because you don't get it. Natural-minded man cannot understand the things of God, for they are spiritually discerned. Now that may be okay initially, because I do the same. I wrestle with things. Yeah, I don't quite see it that way. I'm not sure about that. But my heart issue is, my heart is open to say, God, I am willing to receive. I'm willing to receive, Lord, because I don't have all the answers. I don't have all the stuff I need. And I know you bring people along the way in the path. Because if not, I would have been way back there. I'd be out of church. I'd be running around a professing Catholic who was a drunk drug addict. Probably would have been divorced. Honestly, would have been dead by now. Like some of the folk I hung around with, honestly. But no, God saw it fit to bring this one in. And I actually listened, even though I fought with it, and bring that one in. And I listened after I fought with it, and this one, and now I'm here. I just figured at this point in my life now, it's a lot easier not to fight. Just listen. I may not agree. And as we say, some things may be for the back burner because that's actually down the road and I can't see it yet. I'm still standing here. But that's okay. I believe God has placed in every person a gift that is valuable to me for a time and a place because there's some are back there that no longer have the same kind of influence up here. That's okay too because that was for a time and a place. But the thing is, are you willing to receive from the person God's put in your life as a valuable key in helping you to walk out your destiny. That's why he couldn't do many mighty works there. They were hostile. They took him for granted because of his pedigree. And they had a hostile indifference towards him because they didn't like what he was saying. That's why not much happened there. Not because they stopped him. They weren't willing to receive from him. Certainly it wasn't like the woman with the issue of blood who ran up and went through all this stuff, broke all the laws just to touch the hem of his garment. No, they were the other way. They run him out of town. All right, he says, that's enough. Let's pray. We need to have a time of repentance. So let's stop a minute. Just get quiet before God. And Father, will you do that for each and every one of us? Will you search our heart right now, Lord, and see if there's any wicked way in us? Specifically, this area of contempt, Lord. Is there anyone that we are holding contempt towards? And Father, I pray that your spirit would really take the, the words that I was fumbling over today because I've been distracted, Lord. But I'm trusting your Holy Spirit to bring understanding and revelational knowledge about the difference between just happen to disagree with someone's perspective on something versus having contempt in our heart towards somebody because of that disagreement or becoming so familiar with someone that we take them for granted and then get an indifference towards them that we can't receive from them. Father, will you bring to mind anyone that we need to confess and repent of? And Lord, I'll just pray generally for all of us, forgive us for holding contempt towards other people. Because as I did this past week, I didn't even realize it. It had just happened. I don't think it just happened, but Lord, we've allowed disagreements and familiarity and, and just that knowing to become dishonoring and disrespectful. That spirit has infected us all, Lord, so we repent right now. We command it to go. Lord, we want a clean heart before you, Lord, a heart that is open, a mind that is open to receive what you have for us even when we don't like it, even when you put those 
people in our paths that we think are just an irritant, but you really put them there because they got something we need and we just can't see it yet. And Lord, there are some just an irritant because there is a devil and he's out to distract. I, I know all that. But Lord, your spirit will give us discernment and wisdom to see the difference. So Father, forgive us for anyone we've held contempt towards. Lord, I ask that you would truly help us to grasp this concept that we are all unique in you. That we're all gifted by you. We all have a benefit to the body because you said so. And we can bless others. Help our eyes to see that when it's happening. Because it's usually in our time of distress and despair when we're all worked up emotionally that we don't receive it. So Father, we thank you for what you've done in this place today. We thank you for meeting with us. We thank you that we are radically changed. Thank you that that change continues. It just doesn't stop now. But it'll continue to go and go and go because Lord, we're doing a reset. We are not going back to the same old, same old. We will walk in newness and freshness of your spirit. So Father, pour out that fresh oil fresh fire upon this house both individually and corporately that we will be that light upon the hill that we'll never put the basket over it that we will be the beacon for this city this state and this region we will be that place that sots that revival fire because you reignited it within each one of us this very day. Thank you, Lord. We go blessed and encouraged. Continue to be with Gail. Continue to be with Judy. The situations they're dealing with today, let them know we're there for them. We love them. And Father, if there's any need we can provide because of the gifting you've placed in us, may we be open to do that even this day. In the name of Yeshua. Amen and amen.